Welcome everyone to QI Connect, our first session of 2022 and our 69th since we began. I'm Ruth Glassborough, your QI Connect Chair. So QI Connect provides an opportunity for colleagues across health and social care and beyond to learn from international leaders in the fields of improvement, innovation and integration. So welcome everyone. I'm now going to pass you over to Jess to tell you how it works and how to use the Q&A function to submit your questions for our speaker today, Lord Nigel Chris. The format is slightly different today, so we will have a pause in the middle of the presentation for our guest questioner and some additional questions from our audience. Then we will also include time at the end for further questions. Jess, over to you. Thanks very much, Ruth. Um, so just some housekeeping notes to start with. Please use the Q&A function to submit your question. These will need to be moderated, so it may take a minute or two for your question to show up in the live chat. This session will be recorded and, and by taking part, we have your consent for this. However, please note that attendees cannot be seen or heard in live events and you can stay anonymous when asking questions if you wish. In the event of technical difficulties, please bear with us and we will work to bring the session back at the earliest opportunity. And a recording of this session and resources covered will be made available following the session date. Hold on a second, I've just lost the slides. Um, so on your screen, you'll see the Q&A function on the right hand side. Please use this to submit your questions for Nigel. All questions are pre-moderated, so they may take a minute or two to show up in the main Q&A tab. Your questions will show up in the My Questions tab, and once approved by one of our moderators, will show up in the Featured tab. If you are having any technical difficulties, you can also submit these via the Q&A function, and one of our moderators will respond to you privately. If you see a question someone else has posted that you'd like to see put to the speaker, you can like it and that will ensure that it is more visible to the chair. Thank you. Thank you. And I think we've moved on one slide to too many. So in terms of our audience reach, um, just to highlight that we have had over 5,000 participants engaged with our session since um, in 2021 from 27 different countries. And since we've started uh, QI Connect, we've had over 1300 organisations engaged, including 89 universities and colleges. So delivering QI Connect is very much a team effort and it's an amazing team um, that I work with here. Thank you to all of them. And also, as always, our thanks to NHS Scotland National Videoing Conferencing Service and Mark, who's joining us today and providing excellent support for these live events. Please remember to tweet as you learn today and use the QI Connect hashtag um, and tag in at his QI Connect. And also, if you're not already following us, please do give us a follow. So I am delighted today to introduce our guest speaker, Lord Nigel Chris. He is a philosophy graduate from Cambridge and prior to joining the NHS in 1986, as I believe a general manager for learning disabilities, he spent time in community work industry and the third sector. By 1993, he was chief exec of the Oxford Radcliffe Hospitals. So incidentally, Nigel, you won't know this, but that's where I started my NHS oh. career in 1987, working in my school holidays as a medical records clerk in their A&E department. So it's a hospital okay. I know well. Um, from 2000 to 2006, he was the chief exec of the NHS in England and the permanent secretary of the Department of Health. I think actually you were the only person to hold both offices at the same time. Since retiring from the NHS, and I say from the NHS because he definitely hasn't retired, but since retiring from the NHS in 2006, he's been very active in global health and international development. Um, I think it's four books you've written and you're about to publish your fifth if it's not already published. I know it's going out this month. He's also a senior fellow at IHI, a distinguished visiting fellow at Harvard School of Public Health and an honorary professor 
professor at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. And somehow, in the midst of all of this, he also manages to fit in some gardening and some painting. So like all of our speakers in QI Connect, he has given freely of his time to speak with us today. We're enormously grateful for that and we're really looking forward to hearing his thoughts on this important topic of global health in a time of pandemics, climate change and political turmoil. Nigel, over to you. Well, thank you very much indeed. Um, I'm going to attempt to, to show my slides. It, it always uh, amuses me that they have a, um, uh, a right. I was just asking me if I'm sure I want to share my slides. I do. <laughs> um, so, yes, I do want to share my slides. Here we go. I'm hoping that these slides will now share. Good. OK, thank you. It always amuses me that the that I'm a distinguished fellow at Harvard School. I presume there's another list with the undistinguished fellows on it, which always seems a bit uh, a bit rude. But anyway, this is a great pleasure to to join you. Um, and as uh, Ruth just said, my background's partly the NHS, but actually for the last 15 years, I've spent an awful lot of time working largely in Africa, but um, uh, also in Southeast Asia and a number of other parts of the world um, and basically pro bono in, in, in this sort of um, period. And whilst I was working in Africa, I, I learned this great saying, which is actually on the next slide, the top bit of it. Health is made at home, hospitals are for repairs. Um, it actually was, uh, belongs to Francis Omazwa, who was running the Ugandan Health Service at about the same time as I was chief executive of the English NHS. And what I'm going to do in this presentation is I'm going to do in a way slightly two presentations. The first one is under that title of Health is Made at Home, Hospitals for, are for Repairs, is really quite UK focused, even though it's got that African title, if you like, um, and talking about how we need to change what we're doing in the UK. The second part of the presentation, and we'll have a gap in between for some questions and, and actually partly because um, it's always very boring having one speaker for 30 minutes, so I'm going to break it up a little bit. Um, but after that break, we'll then turn to turning the world upside down again, which is actually the title of the new book, which um, uh, Ruth has just referred to. And that's really about what we in richer countries in the world can learn from low and middle income countries in, in the world and actually how melding our learning uh, is the best way forward for all of us. And one of the other things I learned in Africa is, is that I need to think about health really quite differently. You know, I've been brought up to some extent in the NHS and therefore I had a sort of NHS view of the world. And what I discovered I needed to do was, of course, take off my NHS spectacles and see the world differently and see it in terms of a whole range of different things. And that's partly what I'm going to be talking about in both the first bit of the presentation and the second. But to introduce you to this first bit of the presentation, I think now in terms of health, in terms of three things, which are those three things. That are top there. There's the great and fantastic and wonderful health services, which I guess an awful lot of people are you know, listening to this uh, are, are involved in. Uh, and that's really important. There's also prevention of disease. And in the UK, we're sort of getting a bit into prevention of disease, but there's also creation of health and health creation, and I'll talk about that. Prevention of disease I think about as, as being about um, the causes of ill health and how do you tackle the causes of ill health, but creation of health is about the causes of health, and that's going to be the theme very much of this first bit. And what we need to think about if we accept that, and I'm going to make the argument for it, is that we've got to find much better ways of the health creators in our society, working with government, civil society and health professionals in a post-industrial NHS, because we do have a very industrial model of an NHS, and so do all the rich countries of the world, basically. And of course, we've got to think about a cross-government approach to health and to well-being. So let's just start by saying, so what do we mean by health? And this is the place to start, I guess, the World Health Assembly, uh, when, it, when the World Health Organization was founded, it said that um, health was about the physical, mental and social well-being and not just the absence of disease. Interesting, physical, mental and social. We've always focused on the physical, got better at the mental, but we are only just learning to work with ideas about social well-being. But to take another sort of definition, to think about it for, for us, for you and me, health and well-being, it's about life, it's freedom, it's confidence, it's the quality of our lives, really. It's about our relationships, how we live, what happens to us at work and at school. It's about being all that we can be and living life to the full. That's what really being healthy is about. 
And if we think about creating health, what I mean by creating health is providing the conditions in which people can be healthy and helping them to be so. And ideally, that's what, of course, a parent did for us. What a good teacher can do, what a good school can do, what a good community. All of them, if you like, helping to create resilient, confident, capable and healthy individuals. And health doesn't stand by itself. It's related to all those other uh, those other qualities as well. So that's what I'm thinking about when I'm talking about creating health. And what that means, if we if we, if we go back to my definition at the beginning in health and well-being, I think we've got to think about this as being about health services and health care where the professionals are in charge and taking the lead. Prevention and protection where government very much has the responsibility for regulation, legislation, whether it's about food or about air quality or or, 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 or whatever it is. And then health creation, where actually the whole society has a, ma a magnificent role to play. And let me then for talk about those health creators and who do I mean by the health creators? And let me just give you three examples. I wrote a book called Turning, uh, called um, Health is Made at Home, Hospitals are for Repairs, um, uh, and gave something like 60 examples around the UK. But let me just pick up these three, which give you an idea of what I mean when I'm talking about health creation in a, in a practical sense. Firstly, down in the bottom of Cornwall in the town called Camborne, uh, a policeman there got fed up with chasing young people for vandalism and for minor crimes and for arresting them and booking them. Uh, and he started to work with them. And together they decided that what they'd do would start a dance club. Um, and they started this dance club now 15 years ago and it's still going and it's run by the young people themselves. The policeman is still involved as chair. Um, but during that period, they'd had something like 2000 uh, plus young people through it over that period. And the uh, University uh, uh, of Exeter has actually done studies on it and has shown how this has improved the health and well-being of those young people within that environment. Camborne's quite a rundown town and there were a lot of problems in it, but this has made a real contribution uh, according to that clear research. So what you see there is somebody completely outside the health system, a policeman, uh, deciding he wanted to do something, working with people not about health and well-being, but creating health and well-being by creating the sort of purposeful and meaningful activity. And it's a great and wonderful example. Second example is from the north of England. It's actually from northeast England, from Ted Mo Todd Morden, just near Leeds. Um, and a group of middle aged women decided that they would start growing vegetables in public spaces alongside the road, alongside the playing fields, outside the police station or whatever. And I think they reasoned that um, nobody was it wasn't legal, but they, nobody was going to stop a group of um, middle aged women growing carrots in public places, as it were. And what they describe them as, what the leader of them describes it as, and it's a wonderful woman called Pam Warhurst, is, is she describes it as uh, uh, the gardens, as propaganda gardens, because people come along and say, what are you doing? Why are you doing that? And so on. And, and they start talking and it starts to build community and they, they other people get involved. They start to create community gardens. Um, they start swapping recipes. They've actually um, brought the local refugees from Syria come involved in it, swapping refugees, uh, swapping swapping recipes um, uh, and, and talking about food and, and having community feasts and supporting local growers and so on. And the whole thing is sort of mushroomed, um, without pretending to use a pun, uh, in, in Todmorden. But actually it's also been uh, expanded into 150 other places. So 150 other places around the UK, people under the umbrella of Incredible Edible are doing their own thing in this way. And I hope that it's going to go even further so that we're going to be able to see ways in which people can use derelict land for growing things, for growing vegetables and deep flowers, no doubt, in the future and bringing people together in that way. Again, not about health, but actually creating community and creating well-being within that area and improving people's lives. And the third one, uh, again in the north of England, actually in Skelmersdale, where a woman entrepreneur decided to set up a social business, which she called Sewing Rooms. There's a clue there. It's actually about sewing. Uh, and they won a whole range of uh, contracts for sort of sewing curtains for 
uh, for John Lewis and, the, uh, and and things like this. And it was really, from her point of view, both about bringing some employment into the area, because Skelmersdale, parts of it are, are quite run down, um, but also bringing people together and bringing lonely people together. And they have as part of it a group they call the Silver Sewers, who are older, isolated women who come together to talk again to swap recipes. Again, they've involved refugees locally, and it started to have a real impact. So here are three very different examples of people who have decided they want to do something for their own reasons, not because they're trying to create health, not because they're doing it for the health service or anyone in the health service has even encouraged them to do it, um, not because there's a model, but because they want to improve the life for themselves and other people. And as a result of that, they're actually creating the circumstances in which people can be healthy and having a real impact on people's lives. And this, and I'm sure everyone can think of examples of these sort of things happening in all sorts of different areas um, around the country. And I looked at these 60 and I, I brought out um, what I thought were the key factors about all of them, the key things that it, they had in common. And there were 10 behaviours which were there. The first one, of course, was this one of taking off your NHS spectacles. But the second one was interesting. They always dealt with physical and mental health. We in the health services always separate them, or almost always separate them. And you can see why you segment things in a sort of business-like fashion so you can control them. But actually, in real life, mental and physical health are totally integrated. The third point that I think is really important is none of these people started with a job description or a system. They all started by building relationships. They found other people who wanted to do things with them. They started to work with other people. Uh, they had a purpose and vision in mind, but they didn't have a plan. They had a, an, or if they did have a plan, the plan changed over time. And here's a real difference between the way these people work and the way people work in the health system. We tend to work in the health system and think about systems. We think about plans. We think about objectives. Um, and we tend to end up being plan led, which is quite a rigid way of doing things. Whereas actually the people I'm talking about here are purpose led, vision led. They know where they want to go. And if they need to go in that direction and then in that direction and then in that direction, that's good because it's based on relationships. And indeed, if you think about your work, wherever it is you work, actually relationships are probably what get most things done. They build on strengths, not on weaknesses. Wonderful example of that is a uh, a, a woman in in Salford in Manchester who had been working with the local community and realised that one of the great assets in the community were the unemployed men. Unemployed men are normally seen as a weakness or a problem, something to be dealt with, but actually unemployed men, unemployed fathers, she brought them together and they started to create things in their community, building, treating it as a strength. All of this shows the importance of communities and the linkages that bring people together. On the right hand side of this screen, all of the things they're doing are not because they're, they're jobs. They've all got things that are about meaning and purpose. They're not objectives. They're not in that sense sort of business focused. They're about connecting and communicating. In all of them, the environment they work in matters. In all of them, they're, people are being entrepreneurial in the sense of learning by doing, experimenting, not assuming you know how to do things or following a rigid pattern, but always learning by doing and moving things on. And ultimately, at the bottom of all these behaviours, it's about taking control. It's not being dependent on the NHS or social care or whatever. It's actually taking control to the extent you can in whatever way you can. And of course, taking control is just straightforwardly good for your health and well-being uh, uh, and confidence as well. So you can see when you look at these behaviours how difficult it is going to be for those people working in this sort of way to connect with the people who work in the traditional health system sort of way, or indeed to connect with government and politics and so on. But for the future, we've got to find ways, it seems to me, of how we integrate the various different parts of health, creation health, uh, creating health alongside prevention, alongside services. And within that, clinicians and indeed all professionals have a real role, I believe, as agents of change. They're not telling people what to do, and they're not they're helping people what to do and the sort of example i gave of the of the woman working with a, with a, a community in um in in uh, salford um how she was what she was doing she was in influencing engaging informing enabling listening responding acting she wasn't telling them what to do she was listening to what they wanted to do and working with them to help them do it how she described it as i started at the front of the room she said and i ended up at the back 
And that's the sort of thing you're going to have to do around the world in terms of uh, you as professionals, we as professionals. If you think about the single handed psychiatrist in the state of Bihar in India, how on earth are they going to be able to work if they don't engage the temple, if they don't engage whatever is there locally to help them to do their work of improving mental health? The GP in Surrey who set, who's set up a, who's left her, moved out of her surgery as it were, she's still a clinician in her surgery, but has, has developed a growing health in Hawley network of 30 or 40 organisations that are creating health. The nurse I've talked about, or indeed the nurse or the community health worker in, in, in Africa, and I'm going to come to some examples of those in the second part of this. So clinicians have a real role here, but their role is shifting from the people who do things with people to the people who are in, in many ways, not just being the clinician, but also being these agents of change and making things happen. And all of this takes place against the background where our health as individuals is intimately connected to the health of our communities, to the health of wider society and the health of the planet. Now, I'm not meant to advertise, I'm sure, on this, but I did write a book which pulled together these 60 cases. Um, but what I'm going to do here, if I, if I may, Ruth, is stop at this point and see if that's provoked any questions before I come on to the second part of the presentation, which is really about um, what we can learn in richer countries of the world from people in low and middle income countries of the world, people who don't have our resources, but they also don't have our vested interests and our baggage of history, and they don't have to take off their NHS spectacles and they can see the world as it is rather than in the way that they've been taught to by working within a system. So let me pause at that point. Great, thank you. And you are allowed to advertise your book on these, very much so. And thank you, that was very, really thought provoking. There are loads of questions in the chat box. Um, but before I go to some of those, I'm going to hand over to Akintoya Akinola, who is a specialty doctor for quality improvement in surgery at the Golden Jubilee National Hospital um, in Scotland. Um, and over to you for our guest question. Thank you very much, um, Nigel, for that inspiring presentation. And um, this is a question that, that I, I have to ask today. Uh, one of the things many commentators and researchers in public health and health policy have said in the last two to three, de two to three decades is that the NHS is a national sickness service rather than a national health service. Um, you've giving us insight into why some of these things are, uh, but it's mainly because of the perception of little focus on disease prevention and health promotion, or in one last times, health and wellbeing creation. Do you think that is still largely true today, or is that beginning to change in a, more, in a meaningful way? And secondly, are there any practical changes going forward you would suggest in terms of innovation in workforce training and planning? Thank you very much. Great, thank you. Well, yeah, very pertinent question and it fits in perfectly with what I was talking about, of course. There's an interesting point here because actually maybe we need a national illness service. And I do feel that, and I don't know what people working in the NHS these days feel, but people have unrealistic expectations of the NHS. You know, I use that expression, you know, hospitals are for repairs. If you think about a lot of the underlying reasons why people are ill or need help in hospitals, poverty, addictions, uh, depression, being out of work, a whole range of, of uh, obesity. You know, actually the NHS can't do much about the causes of those. Um, they're picking up the pieces afterwards. So I do think, you know, the NHS needs to do what it can do best really well. Um, uh, government needs to do more in, in terms of pr the prevention of disease and protection, but actually, what about employers? What about um, schools? What about the responsibility? It was a school in Scotland, wasn't it, that started the, the Daily Mile, um, running a, a mile at, uh, at lunchtime, making the teachers run as well, I note, um, which sounds to be thoroughly a good idea. Um, uh, and, you know, and that has improved their education attainment, but it's also improved health as well, um, all, all, all the way around. So, so I do think there's, the, the, there's a bit here about, don't let's hang everything on the NHS, you know? You know, our health is our health. The NHS does a great job or can do a great job 
Um, so let's let's be a bit clearer about some of these things. And that's why I threw in the slide uh, about you and, and other doctors, but nurses and physios and everybody else being actually agents of change because actually you've got you've got the knowledge and the expertise so you can actually help and support people to do some of these other things. Um, but, you know, I guess I don't know what speciality you are, but, you know, uh, I guess we're really keen that you stay in theatre a lot of the time as well, because we do need surgery done. Um, uh, and, and that's, uh, uh, you know, we do need the repairs done. Um, so if I just pick up on the on your, your final point about um, uh, uh, about the changing education, I do think it's really important that education does change. Um, and where I took this expression agents have changed from, again, with their permission, um, was from a a, um, a review, a Lancet review that was done 10 years ago, 12 years ago, in which I happened to be a member, uh, which was on the future education of health professionals. And it described three levels of learning that you as professionals go through. The first one is the informative bit. This is when you become specialists. This is when you understand the body systems and you understand the science and you, you do all that. The second bit is when you add that to behaviours and values and you become professionals. And that's the formative bit when you become professionals. But the third level is this level where actually you become leaders, agents of change. You're able to influence and engage. Um, and you think of you think of, you know, the single handed psychiatrist in Bihar. However good they are as an individual clinician, actually what they really need to be good at is getting other people involved in improving mental health. Because, you know, you can only add don't know how many mental health patients or psychiatrists can see a day, but it's, you know, it's a few handfuls, isn't it? And Bihar's a big state, you know? So actually there's another set of experiences and uh, and skills that I think professionals need to, need to learn. And some people are moving in that direction, um, but it'll take some time to get there. Great, thank does you. Does that make sense, actually? Can I ask a question back or do you want to move on to other questions, Ruth? Mm. I'm going to uh, move on to some other questions, if that's OK, just because there's so many coming right, through. I'm sorry, yeah. um, and uh, Rachel Wilson Lowe is asking, you mentioned that we've only really begun to touch on social health. How do you see social health being prioritised and developed in the future? Well, um, I think th th there's a health systems answer to that. Um, but I'm guessing that Rachel probably works in, in, in Scotland um, and I don't want to give an English answer because in England we've gone through, we're going through a process of, of trying to devolve much more to a local level um, and, 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 and to bring together health and social care and, and local groups locally. And once you start to do that, then I think you can find a way of getting housing into it. You can find a way of getting, you know, because people talk a lot about the importance of health and social care linking. Well, of course. <laughs> but what about housing? What about education? Anyone in public health will give me a much bigger list than I could uh, I could ever produce. Um, uh, and we've got to find methods of, of, of doing that. But my, one point that I, I often make, and I think because I think it's true, um, is that change takes place in the most important place of all, which is in the heads of professionals. If you as doctors and nurses and others begin to see health in this bigger way and, and realise that you don't have to see it in terms of your discipline, your your your, your speciality and so on. But yeah, you, you want to work in your discipline, your speciality, but you also want to be part of this bigger thing. Then uh, and that the people working in housing and the quality of houses is really important, then I think it will start to change. And that's why I think that very first question about health professional education is really important um, because it's how you as clinicians, how you as professionals um, see the world that matters. Um, but then you've got to get some mechanisms as well. But it's shifting a bit in England and we've just um, in Parliament just going through a thing, a, a bill on health and on a health and care system where a lot of people are making these points. Ten years ago, they weren't. So the thing is shifting, but it shifts slowly. But the truth is change will happen if it happens in your heads. And if you do something, don't wait for somebody to tell you what to do, do something. Absolutely. And I know the, the place based work um, in particular, which, yeah. you know, the place based system work, I think is really powerful. And obviously there's the work in Wigan, but we also have work up in Scotland and places like um, Ayrshire. Um, yeah. doing some amazing work there. Um, I'm going to pick one more question if it's OK before we then move on to your second section. So um, this is from Goran Sangana 
um, who is asking whether there is a role for decolonising global health literature in guiding the UK's global health work and more specifically as an example um, asking whether advisory boards for instance could be staffed by colleagues from the global south. Well, I'd go much further than that. I mean, in fact, the, the, the book that I'm going to come on to picks up some, some of these points. I, mean, I think de decolonising is really important uh, on, on, a, on so many different levels. Um, one is bringing other pe pe people in in whatever way and on advisory boards would be good. I actually think, you know, the sort of partnerships. The, uh, I know in the UK there's something like 200 partnerships between UK hospitals and hospitals around the world, mainly in Africa, but quite a few in, in Southeast Asia as well. Um, and I think the interchange, the constant interchange is, is, is really important. I think there's an aspect of decolonization which we don't always pick up on properly, and I'm going to pick up on it, I hope, in, in, the, in the next bit, um, which is to understand that Western scientific medicine isn't the total answer. It's a good answer, um, but it's only part of the question. Uh, and I'll talk about a the Toronto Birth Centre, for example, which is um, First Nations people in um, uh, uh, in uh, Canada, Toronto, obviously, um, who have actually created a completely different sort of environment for, for women to deliver in and for their families to come. Um, so there's, there's, there's more than one set of knowledges. Um, I also am start, starting to stop talking about global health and talking about health globally myself, although you'll see the title of my book's Global Health, um, because somebody pointed out to me, global health is almost exclusively taught in rich country universities. <laughs> um, uh, and uh, too many people think global health is about people in low and middle income countries. It ain't. It's about the health of, the, of people globally. But anyway, let me stop there and go on to the second bit, shall I? Uh, that sounds like a brilliant moment to transition to your second bit. Right, I'm going to try and get my slides back if I can. Let me see if I can do this. Open share tray. Sorry, I seem to be. Um, I don't know whether anyone can help me with this. Oh, there we go. This system is running very slowly. It's the joy of the virtual. It always goes slow at the most inconvenient yeah. moment. <laughs> yeah. Um, I have asked to share here. I don't know if the people in the background can put my slides up for me. So, Looks like yes. So here we go. Good. I think. I think we put them up for you, which means we have to move them along. Oh, OK, OK. Well, would you go to um, slide? Uh, I think it's actually number 14, if you would. Oh, you have gone to it. Thank you. No, no, the, the one before, the one you were on. So turning the world upside down again. This is the title of a new book and global health in you don't need to. The subtitle explains itself, doesn't it? Um, and since I wrote that, of course, political turmoil has become um, appalling, uh, whatever is the right word. Let me turn to the uh, next slide, please. So what this book is about is Powerful high income countries, power and high income, power and resources. We can learn a great deal from people in lower income ones and the elite in any country can learn from their poorer communities. Now, I'm not going to say very much about that, but I'll pick up on it. Combining the learning from all our countries and all parts of our communities can bring real and sustainable process. And we have to think now in the new climate about rethinking our ideas about global solidarity and building on relationships between people and taking action. I mean, so many things have damaged global solidarity over the last three or four years. I don't know those of you who've been engaged in health globally for some time will remember probably that, you know, the beginning of the, the beginning of the century, there was a great optimism about the uh, uh, about Africa and, uh, and a great optimism about making change in the world and global solidarity and the Millennium Development Goals and optimism around the Sustainable Development Goals. Well, my feeling is in the last three or four years, this has really started um, to evaporate, sadly, and we have because we can't trust our governments, we can't trust the big organisations. And I believe we have to build solidarity bottom up in a, in a very different way uh, in, in this way. So let me talk a little bit about the first point, the per that, that what we can learn from low and middle income countries. And let me go on to the next slide, please. Now, what this is not about, it is not about reverse innovation. People talk about reverse innovation, meaning 
innovations from low income countries going to richer countries, which I have to say, I hate the expression. It's deeply patronizing and it's deeply misleading. Do you suggest that innovation flow from low income countries is less good than innovation from rich countries? And where do you think innovation comes from? Anyway, it always comes from outside the elite. So it's why it's innovation as the elite will carry on with the status quo. So I always avoid talking about reverse innovation. Frugal innovation, um, slightly different, um, fr oh, sorry, very different. Frugal innovation is, uh, or Jugad in innovation from India, is very much about doing things with the cheapest facility or uh, equipment and whatever that is around. And that's a different issue altogether. But reverse innovation, I think just innovation. I also don't like the expression task shifting because it seems to suggest, doesn't it, that people's needs as people are being defined by how prof what professionals would deal with them in the West, <laughs> you know? Whereas my problem is a problem, it's not whether it needs to be done with a doctor or a nurse, you know? Uh, uh, and I think task shifting also, uh, you're wearing professional spectacles when you're talking in that way. And I also think we need to get away from the economic language which has dominated us. Um, we talk about supply and demand in healthcare now, don't we? That only came in about 15 years ago, 20 years ago, probably. And uh, it's straightforward economics. We talk about incentives. We talk about businesses. We used to talk about needs and services instead of service, supply and demand. And instead of incentives, we talked about motivation. And I remember when the Labour government started talking about incentives with consultants, how pissed off they got. You know, they were motivated. They didn't need to be incentivized. I mean, they didn't mind the extra money. Um, but they weren't going to be incentivized to care. They were because they were motivated by their professionalism and whatever it was that took them into medicine or nursing in the first place. Um, and we need to think about society, not just businesses, real life, if you like. Um, and I, also what I'm talking about is not so much about innovations, you know, which tend to be, you know, techniques or, or, or things, but about attitudes, behaviours, mindsets, ways of thinking and of seeing the world. So with that, let me just move on to the next slide again, please. Um, just a couple of points I need to just make about high and low income countries. This isn't some sort of romantic notion about uh, low income countries. Let's be clear that in low income countries, when you look at it, there's just straightforwardly more disease, more poverty, less resources, and they're powerless often in international trade and wider relationships, which are the economic forces that are keeping countries poorer apart from anything else. And the great statistic, of course, is that Africa, with what is it, about 17% of the world's population, has more than a quarter of the disease and 4% uh, of the resources and 1% of the staffing to deal with it. But what's interesting in those countries, systems are too weak and can't deliver. But if I t turn to the rich countries where I live, we are affected by the changing disease pattern, moving to the non-communicable diseases or the long-term conditions, chronic conditions, and we're having to invent and create new service models that are really just don't fit. You know, if we've still got a 20th century model of service, we've got to start thinking in a very different way and about networks, not systems, uh, and innovation. Um, uh, and, and, uh, and, and our incentives in the system all promote the status quo. They all try and make us stay where we are. So we're trying to use 20th century models to deal with 21st century issues. And the funny thing is, where the systems are too weak in low and middle income countries or low income countries, the systems are too strong and getting in the way in, in high income countries. So if I put that another way on the next slide, please. People in these countries, these are two quotes I use. Um, the boy died of measles. We all know he could have been cured at the hospital, but the parents had no money. And so the boy died a slow and painful death, not of measles, but from poverty. That was a man in Ghana or a woman in the UK uh, talking to me about all the complications she'd had with trying to get treated because she very foolishly had more than one condition. In fact, she had about four or five different conditions. And of course, things would have gone better if they'd listened to me. You know, the system took over and segmented her in different ways. So, you know, there's a lot we need to learn from the richer countries. There's a lot that poorer countries uh, need to get as well. Um, so if I take off my Western spectacles, so I go to the next slide. Let me just give you a few examples here. I mean, the, 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 there's an enormous range of them about how health workers work in low and middle income countries. Um, I think about Africa, about community health workers. I think about the health extension the workers in, in, in um, Ethiopia who can essentially do 20 things. Ten of them are preventative or 
preventative essentially and 10 of them are, are, are curative in, in whatever way but these are local women or exclusively in that case um, in local areas working with uh, people at a very local level um, people who understand their lives and their culture and how to get things done at that most local level we're actually just seeing in the uk in london uh, an example of community health workers being set up in a ward in Westminster ward actually um, on the Brazilian model of community health workers and they're being mentored by Brazilian health workers, uh, community health workers elsewhere. But I think there's a great potential role for that very local level worker and there's examples of that being used in New York. Another example, Tecnico de Curaguia, um, uh in um, uh, Mozambique. Um, Mozambique, uh, where, uh, when they um, when, when the Portuguese left and there was uh, civil war, um, the doctors essentially left and went back to Portuguese, Portugal, um, and there were very, very few doctors around the country. And the then Minister of Health, a great man called Pascual Mukumbi, uh, who was himself a doctor, um, set up a programme of teaching surgical technicians to do obstetric surgery. Um, and it's still done in most of rural Mozambique by these Tecnico de Sirigue, uh, and they get as good results as physicians in the same circumstances, um, cost about a third the amount, of course they stay in the countries whereas the physicians may well emigrate. So some really, I'm not suggesting that you definitely have surgical technicians doing that in Glasgow, um, but nevertheless that really does shake up your thoughts and the, and the research done in the British Journal of Obs and Gynae uh, several papers on this showing that there's no difference between a physician doing it and these people doing it. Really makes you think about how you need to think about health workers differently. Communities, mothers to mothers in Africa, this is actually about uh, how one of the big ways in which um, the transmission of HIV, a, HIV from mothers with HIV to their unborn children has been slowed down and stopped in many cases is by having mentor mothers uh, mothers with HIV working with the mothers to be explaining how they need to manage things and so on working with them from their culture and from their background very different way of working from the way that we might line up a professional uh, to work with a person in, in whatever way Toronto Birth Centre I already talked about um, a, 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 a extraordinary example of um, a group of people from indigenous backgrounds in Canada, so First Nations or, or Inuit or Metsi, um, coming together to create a birth centre where people could give birth in the way that fitted in with their um, lifestyle, their, they, they, uh, and their lifestyle and their culture, uh, the architecture fitted in with their culture. They were able to have the family come and join them in, in, in ways that were really uh, important as well. And then I think about wider society and changes off changes in wider society that we've seen elsewhere. Um, we see that in, in, in BRAC, for example, BRAC in Bangladesh, extraordinary organ, organization, provides a lot of the health services in uh, Bangladesh, but isn't a health organization itself. Um, I remember meeting the founder um, uh, and talking with him about how he handled things and how they had managed to make quite significant changes in maternal mortality, for example. Um, and in infant mortality and his line he didn't give me a great he didn't uh, you know he might have given me 10 pages of plans or whatever which I'd have got from a European minister uh, what he actually said to me was um, empower the women um, and Brack started off with women's empowerment classes worked with them worked with them around their health and things they were interested in um, started to uh, provide a, a microfinance to them uh, set up shops so they could sell their produce, set up a university um, and developed a whole range of things that that showed how you were linking together health with the economy, with empowerment, with having voice and so on. So extraordinary examples and I put Finland in there, which I know is not a low and middle income country, um, but just as a reminder that, you know, elsewhere around the world, people have begun to understand the health in all policies uh, sort of approach that actually um, if you're going to improve health in a 
in a very healthy country like Finland, actually you've got to work with the farmers, you've got to work with the educators, you've got to work with other people, but it's the same sort of point. So you can see people around the world who are really doing things in very different ways that we can learn from. Not to copy, you can copy some of them, of course, and the Toronto Birth Centre, I guess you could copy, um, but actually so you can learn from and make you think about how you do things differently in your own country. So let me just um, throw on the next slide quickly. Um, and, and there were about seven or 10 things that seemed to me very special about these after I looked at them in, in some detail. Um, first one is we don't segment health off as separate. Health is part of human life. You know? We don't put it in a special building over there. Now, of course, you need to put your surgery in a special building over there and make sure the airflow is good and everything that you need. Um, but actually, let's just remember this is about real life, not about something technical. Um, the importance of engaging and working with communities and especially women. The importance of empowering people about linking health with the economy, with rights and a voice. The bit about the, 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 the workforce training for the role and not just for the profession and bringing together, if you like, what we have separated more in America than in the UK um, of public health and clinical medicine. So some real learning that we can pick up uh, and think about. And if we think for a moment, about um, uh, what's happened in, in, in Western scientific medicine. If I can go on to the next slide. If you look back at the, the history of, uh, of Western, uh, Western scientific medicine, it's really rested on four things. One is greater professional competence. Um, you know, the, the way that the Flexner report in 2010 for the doctors or the Rose Walsh report in uh, 2015, sorry, 1910 and 1915, uh, the Flexner report introduced science into medicine <laughs> um, and, and actually resulted in something like a third of the medical schools in America shutting down um, because, you know, so they, they you know, you, you as professionals have been becoming more and more competent over the years and that includes understanding systems and QI. That's part now of professional competence. So that's been one of the great drivers of Western scientific medical medicine. Scientific discovery. I mean, we really got sort of adequate anaesthetics, didn't we, at the beginning of the, 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 the 20th century. Um, but then you move on into all the, the, the discoveries around genetics and so on that are now finally moving on in, in the beginning of this century. A huge amount of commercial innovation that really has helped us to um, move on in terms of how we have, uh, you know, and, and some of that's about drug discovery, for example, um, and, and the commercial involvement in that, and massively increased spending and activity. If you look at the percentage of GDP that we were spending in 1960, it was about one or two percent. Um, now, even in the UK, it's up to nine. And of course, uh, as you all know, US is up to 16 and the average of uh, richer countries around the world is is above 10 percent. So these are all the things that are keep coming and driving uh, have driven improvement. But we've come to this point where we've got a model now um, that we're still trying to apply last century's model to this this century's work. So let me move on to the next um, slide. Um, and what I argue is that actually if you look at what's happening in low and middle income countries, then all of these things need to be modified as we think about the future. Greater professional competence is achieved through patients and communities empowering and being empowered by the professionals. You know, that's, I think, one of the next great changes that is going to come in as you drive on professional competence. Scientific discovery is made relevant by our understanding of society and cultures and how to apply it. This is about how science needs to work into the, 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 the social aspects that we were talking about. And it requires public support and accountability because we've all seen the way in which science can run away um, with technical innovations that actually don't do much good for the health of the population. And the same thing applies in commercial innovation. And it's at its most effective when it's undertaken in partnership with health systems properly regulated and linked with wider, wider societal goals. And what about vaccines? What about vaccine development as the absolute paradigm of that? Now that's an emergency and so on, but that was a brilliant piece of commercial innovation linked in with government and the NHS and uh, and everybody else. And then finally, we need to change our, our focus from spending and activity and replace it by measures of social and economic uh, gain 
uh, and the impact on, on population as well as on individual health. So we need to turn Western medicine upside down. And so my argument is all in this uh, in this book, which we published in a month's time, uh, and you can get a 20% discount if I'm allowed to advertise on here, Ruth, um, by, uh, by entering that code at checkout. Um, so that's quite a brief run through that, but you can see how that builds on some of the earlier points I was make, making about what we are, what people are doing in this country. And we really do need to think about the world differently uh, and, and see that change is coming from places we haven't tended to look for it, including poorer communities in our own country and, and low and middle income countries around the world. Let me stop there. We've still got 10 minutes, I think, for questions. We do indeed. And that was so inspiring. Thank you. And that Thanks. challenge about how much we have to learn from the lower and middle income countries. Um, really powerful challenge there and some lovely examples. Uh, we've continued to get lots of questions coming in by the chat box. Uh, and just to remind delegates, you can vote for the ones you like. I will be guided not dictated to, but guided by your votes, but I may pick some from lower down the voting list. But I'm going to go to one that's got a, a, a lot of support from Julianne. Um, she's highlighting that we've had integrated health and social care Scotland actually since 2016, but the issue is spreading the changes that are in the healthcare professionals' head. So she's saying she's worked in the NHS and the third sector. Her experience in the third sector, was it Encouraged creativity and innovation that was relationship focused. Mm -hmm. But the experience in the NHS is that we limit this due to the red tape. So, how do you think we can go about changing this? Well, the, the, there was one big hope, which I don't know how it's working out in Scotland, which was that actually things changed during the pandemic. I heard so many. I'm, I, you know, I'm not. I wasn't involved in in fighting the pandemic, but I talked to a lot of people who who, who were, and I heard so many examples of people saying we work differently when we had to, <laughs> and you know, health and social care came together, and and housing, I, 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 housing association who'd who who were doing some great things on health, preventing falls and so on, who couldn't get their NHS part neighbours to even talk to them suddenly found the NHS wanted to talk to them um, uh, and, and they changed the way they were doing things. So the, there is still, and I think there still is some hope, that there's a sort of reset here. It's not about going back to the old normal. So I, I don't know what's happening about that in Scotland. I do know some of that in, in, in England and people are trying to hang on to that idea that actually there were gains that we, we could get. So I think this at that level. I also think we've still got to we still got to work on the people at the top of the system as well <laughs> uh, as the people uh, down the system and, and try and get. Um, we're going to have in, in, in England, and I'm sure this will be the same in Scotland, a great drive on waiting lists and it's going to get technical and it's going to get sort of as you know hospital focused and surgeon focused and so on. Um, and of course that's important, but it's got to be balanced by some other stuff and people like me in Parliament are trying to make these arguments uh, at the top of the system. Um, but my observation as well is that Julianne, um, she knows about this because she's worked in the, I don't know you Julianne, but you know you've worked in the social sector and you've worked in charities and so on, you've worked in, in different areas and you can see it happening. There must be other people like you. Can you get together? Can you do something about it? Can you sort of try and create some influence and some influencing groups? There's a, there's a great expression from a, a Dutch um, neurologist, who, who, which I learned, which is that when you're trying to get something done, three things, start small, just start small, you know, something that you can get your hands around and make happen. Think big, you know, you want to change the world. Go fast. And the importance of go fast is, of course, they won't catch up with you um, uh, and you've got to maintain momentum and, and keep making change happen. So I think quite a lot's in people's hands, you know, people like me can try and influence at one level and, uh, and so on. But, um, you know, people, people will make the change. Indeed. And there's a lovely example someone's posted. It's not a question, it's an example that when they were in rural South Sudan, they taught the local blacksmith to do eyelid rotation surgery to treat trachoma, and he did it really well. Um, right. yeah. Thank you. Um, 
So Hannah is highlighting that what you're talking about is a big cultural change and a shift that's needed that includes a lot of unlearning and relearning. And that's a lot to ask and expect from the public who've seen the NHS as the fixer for all health needs. So her question is, how do we do this without a huge government and social backing? Well, I don't think you want government and social backing because government will try and back you into whatever it is that they want you to back you into. You know, so this better not be government led. Um, although government can 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 help with it, it needs to, it needs. I believe it needs to be you know professional led actually, and I don't mean by the BMA and people like that who are, you know, the trades unions, if I may be rude. Um, but actually, it needs to be led by by, by leading uh, by, by people within the system itself who get it. I think it would be for younger people. There's less unlearning to do. <laughs> Um, I was with the vice chancellor of a uh, of, of, of a university that does a, a in the UK that does a lot of um, nurse education, and he was saying um, we lose a quarter of them at the end. Um, and he, he says, "How come we've got a system that knocks so much out of these young people, that knocks so much motivation out of them, uh, and not one that that um, motivates them to to, to continue?" Um, and I think there's something quite profound there about um building up change with young people and if you're a nurse do join the nursing now challenge which is 50,000 nurse young nurses around the around the globe who are doing this sort of thing um because i think you can make change in ways that other other people can't do so i think there's a lot of unlearning and learning as for the public um uh, i'm getting old and i in the house of lords i'm actually still quite young in the house of lords um but i do notice a lot of my and, and all my colleagues in the house of lords all all have got you know something wrong with them because we all have by the time we're my age um and actually we quite like nurses you know we've actually discovered that you know you don't necessarily need a gp why aren't you going to a practice nurse and most of us I, an awful lot of us are going to practice nurses um it, 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 rather than the gp of course you need the gp for certain things and so on um i think the public will change and i think you as professionals will change with the public and and i, and I do think um uh, the, the 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 really important thing is when people learn through experience you know i mean newspapers will still talk about doctors and and, and hospitals but health isn't about doctors and hospitals health is about something bigger Great and a great call to action there, particularly from our nursing community. Um, I think we have time for one more question. Um, so I'm going to go to Anonymous, who is asking, as a nation, do you believe that we need to rethink our NHS to identify what it is we want from it? And more importantly, what we are prepared to pay for through taxes? Well, thank you for this last question. And, and you're picking up points that, that people so often talk about. And isn't it amazing that the discussion about the NHS ends up being a financial discussion? Isn't that bonkers? You know, but that's what happens. They turn a, a health question into a financial question. I don't mean anonymous. I mean the newspapers and politicians and so on. Actually, what we should be doing is deciding what we want and then discussing the finance afterwards. Whereas we seem to start off thinking there's a limited supply of health commodities, as it were, but that's if you're talking about health commodities. But what about health? Um, my answer to this question is, why aren't we investing heavily? And I don't just mean money, but priority and uh, and, and and people's time uh, in the prevention, but not just the prevention, the creative elements. You know, if you actually did do something in some of our purest communities in, in the country uh, around rebuilding some of the social um, value within those communities, the social facilities, supporting a lot of these little things we're talking about. Um, the NHS can't cure itself. I, I, I said earlier that, you know, obesity, addictions, a lot of stress at work, um, you know, all, all the all air pollution, you know, a, a lot of that end up with respiratory diseases in our hospitals, you know, NHS can't do all those stuff. So actually, the question is, if we're trying to improve health, let's get some really serious about this other range of stuff, which isn't just prevention. Um, it is about creating places where people want to live and where it's worthwhile to live and where people can look after each other as well, um, as well as looking at the NHS. But don't rush to the question about how much money, because there's only one answer to the question about how much money, um, which is, oh, spend more. You know, why aren't we like America spending 16 percent? Um, uh, and, and you'll get 
people then coming up with their financial plans for it instead of starting off by talking about health. You know, why do you turn a health question into a finance question? Finance is important. The economy is fi fundamentally important and fundamentally linked with health. Um, but the biggest asset in a country is the health of its people um, because they the, provide the workforce, they provide the productivity and they provide everything else in terms of um, uh, the creativity and uh, and so on. So we should start that question somewhere else. Um, and I won't ask anonymous his or her views because they're staying anonymous. But thank you for that. Thank you. And it's um, it's just such an important issue, isn't it? How we rethink how we design yeah. and deliver services. And then in, in, in Scotland, we're increasingly now using the Scottish approach to service design. Um, so using service design methodologies in our work to actually really deeply understand the, the, the needs of the people using the service and to rethink how we design services to meet their needs. And I think that ties in a lot to the some of the place based work as well that we were talking about earlier. But individuals on the call who are interested, I would recommend looking at the um, IHUB collaborative communities work and we can send a link out um alongside the link around this video is there's uh, there was a great session there including toby lowe who um, is leading on work around human learning systems which is some fantastic work that actually demonstrates that a lot of the problem is that we've designed completely the wrong things which mean we spend a lot of money doing the wrong things um, and it is actually cheaper at times to do the right things for people um, so this is a really interesting area that I think we're going to see a lot of advances on over the next couple of years. Thank you so much, uh, Nigel. That has been a fantastic session. Really appreciate your time um, and we um, look forward, we hope, to um, reading your book. Thank Please. you. <laughs> So um, just to move on and remind everybody about what we have coming up next time. So in April, we are going to be joined by Dr. Amar Shah, who is the Chief Quality Officer from East London NHS Foundation Trust. Uh, Amar has led work there, I think, for about the last four to five years. Um, some fascinating and really impactful work around QI that has also gone out into the wider community work now. So that promises to be another insightful and thought provoking session. Of course, just to remind you all that our back catalogue is available for you to watch and enjoy on our website or you can visit the QI Connect YouTube channel. So it just remains for me to say thank you everybody for joining and hopefully we will see you all next time. Thank you.